What is going on, everybody? John Middlecoff, Three and Out Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever you may listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, as well. If you watch it on YouTube, leave a comment, subscribe, smash that like button, share this video and all of our videos of the volume with your friends, as well as live on AMP. It's where we are all week long, every single week of the year, all of our content. Download the Amazon AMP app. And let's dive into some football. The schedule just came out, and I am going to go through every single game this year. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but we will dive into some thoughts on the schedule, some other thoughts from around the league, uh, ma mainly focus on uh, the opening weekend, some of the big games, and, and just some initial thoughts. And as next week, we'll dive in deeper into the schedule, so just some initial reactions uh, but before we do that, do you want to go to one of these games? If you're listening right now and you're a fan of whatever team, the Bengals, Seattle, you got some buzz, you're a Houston Texans fan, the Cowboys, this is our year. I got you covered. You want to buy some tickets? Download the official ticketing app of this show, Game Time. Very easy to do. Just go to your smartphone, download Game Time, and use the promo code JOHN. That's J-O-H-N, JOHN, J-O-H-N, and get $20 off. Any pair of tickets. You want to go to a game before that? Obviously, the football doesn't start till September. Just use the game time app. Baseball, basketball, concerts, comedy shows. They got you covered. Promo code John. Where do we start? The NFL over the last, I don't know, definitely decade, but the last five, six years has entered into a different stratosphere than these other leagues in terms of viewership. It's well documented, right? The amount of people that watch football relative to other sports. And I think sometimes, and I really fight against this, people think I'm like a hater, and I'm not. I, I'm a huge sports fan. I love basketball. I love baseball. I just, as life has gone on, I don't watch as much of it as I used to relative, obviously, to football. It's my job. But the numbers speak for themselves. The record viewership, the amount of people that just watch Thursday night football. As I talked about earlier this week, Amazon, you know, and the NFL trying to figure out a way to get them better ratings, to get more people to watch. It's like, well, how many people watch? Up oh, nine and a half million people on average. And let's face it, Thursday night games have been pretty hit or miss. And part of it, you could argue, was didn't feel like Al was super locked in. And Herb Street, I like Kirk Herb Street a lot. He's fantastic on college, but you know, I, do, I don't need him calling my NFL games. You know, I, I I like Troy. I like Chris Collinsworth. Not the biggest Romo guy, but he's an NFL guy. I like my NFL guys calling my NFL. Just like I like my college guys calling my college guys. I don't want to pigeonhole anyone, but sometimes once you've been doing something for a while, you kind of get pigeonholed. Football is very, very difficult to call because of the amount of people, the moving, the, the amount of turnover with coaches and rosters. And think about week one. The NFL is, I wouldn't say got cocky, but they went, you know what? We got this guy named Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs, which kind of feel like the Golden State Warriors because Mahomes, like Curry, just feels like the ultimate superstar right now. All the kids like him. You put him on TV. The ratings are enormous. Steph Curry and the Warriors, when they played the Kings in the first round, shattered records. Highest rated first round series in like 30 plus years. It's not complicated to figure this out. It's not the Sacramento Kings. They hadn't been to the playoffs in 17 years. It's Steph. People like watching Steph Curry play basketball. No different than Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes could play Arizona State next week. If he was the quarterback, 10 million people are watching without hesitation. He's that big of a rock star. But when you look at the Chiefs' schedule... You could have thrown a lot of games, right? They play the Bills, they play the Bengals. That's an easy one. But I bet the networks go, you know what? Let's put one in October and another one in December, right? You could have been like the Chargers, the Raiders are a rivalry. Uh, with Jimmy Garoppolo now and Josh McDaniels, definitely the Broncos, who now don't just have Russell Wilson, who may or may not be washed, but they added Sean Payton week one. That's a fantastic just game for our eyes. And they went, you know what? Let's take this up-and-coming pesky team that historically is not very good, the Lions. Like, kind of a cocky move. And I'm bullish on the Lions. I'm going to pick them to win the division. But let's be real. 
You are going in on Thursday night football to a team that has been to three Super Bowls in five years, won two of them, and let's face it, feels like they could go on a dynasty-type run. A ton of people, probably including myself, are going to pick them to win the Super Bowl. They have a loaded team. All those rookies last year that started all those games at the end of the season and through the playoffs and won the Super Bowl, they're back. They have the best player in the sport, and they have the best coach currently in the sport. And Travis Kelsey still feels like he's in the peak of his powers. And you go with the Lions, who, like I said, bullish on him. But here's a reality. Patrick Mahomes and Andy are used to being the hunted. They take every team's best shot, right? Everyone's coming for them. Just like Alabama football or Duke basketball or Tom Brady and Belichick all those years. Or every time, you know, a Pedro Martinez or Roger Clemens or whoever in the peak of their power, Justin Verlander, pitched in their prime. You're getting the other teams, the other players, the other coaches, all their energy. And it's going to be very, very interesting with the Lions, not just this game, but this season, how they handle it. And from a rating standpoint, this game will be fine. But I'm very interested to watch this team now that hasn't accomplished anything. I mean, they won eight of their last, whatever, nine or ten games last year and had a lot of momentum and ended Aaron Rodgers' run in Green Bay. But every year is a brand new year. Every player will tell you that. Every coach will tell you that. Anyone associated with the NFL to a man reiterates that. Why? Because there's so much turnover every single season. We all think the Eagles are freaking awesome because they are. Look at their roster. They lost both coordinators. They lost a guy that had 11 sacks last year in Javon Hargrave. Like, they lost players. At the end of the season, Lane Johnson was duct taped together. He's an older player who's just been in. Things change. I am think the Eagles are going to be really good, but it's just hard year to year to year. Like, it's why it's so impressive what Andy's done, what Belichick and Brady did all those years. And it's going to be fascinating to watch. Everyone's going to be talking about the Lions all preseason. Last year, it was because of hard knocks. And what happened? They started one and six. Well, this year, obviously week one, you could play the Houston Texans. You're getting the team's best shot. But every single game, people are going to be watching this team, especially early on. How do they handle the expectations? Look what happened already. Jamison Williams, who they drafted last year in the top 15, suspended. Because he bet on a game at the facility. Not an NFL game, a college football game. Jameson, you do understand that these companies track you and they don't want to get in trouble and they'll turn you in. So, I, you know, listen, that place is going to be going bananas. Kansas City is essentially like an SEC town for the NFL when it comes to football. Their passion, their team's incredible. They're led by the best coach they've ever had, the best player they've ever had. It's going to be fascinating to watch the Lions go in there. Because, listen, they, they don't have to win. They're going to be – I'm sure the Lions are already out. They're going to be an underdog by probably six or seven points. But do they just look respectable, right? Or do they kind of, like, first game of the year, just kind of get boat raced, get overwhelmed by it? Something uh, I'm fascinated by. It feels like, and I could be wrong on this, over the last 20-plus years, if NBC had their choice, they would go with some combination of Cowboys at Giants – Giants at Cowboys, right? Cowboys, biggest brand, best TV product, not in terms of best team. I just mean the most people watch. It's not arguable. I'm not saying that I'm not a Cowboy fan. It's just a fact. And the Giants, when they're good, play in New York City with fan bases are just based on, well, how many people follow your team? And it's pretty clear the biggest brands have the most fans. So when you put, when the Steelers are good, when the Packers are good, when the Niners are good, when the Giants are good, obviously when the Cowboys are good, they just have more fans than these other teams. Like the Jags this year could go 16-1, and one, but their ceiling as a franchise is only so high because of the quantity of the amount of fans that they have. Well, now the Giants went through one of the most embarrassing stretches in franchise history, right? From Shermer to Joe Judge, it was a joke, and you couldn't put them on Sunday Night Football with a straight face. One season of being very respectable, getting to the playoffs, boom, they get that nod. And that's a really good game. You know, the Cowboys, I, I just saw on Twitter right before I hopped on, they get three Sunday night football games. I, I got news for you. If Sunday night and NBC, which is the number one television show in America, could have 
15 of the 17 Cowboy games, they would. Like, they, they would not hesitate. So this game, you know, the Giants, they love the NFC East because of the markets, Dallas, New York. You know, people want Washington to be bad, you know, very, very badly around the league because of their – they have a large fan base. They've just been relatively irrelevant, and obviously Philadelphia. So uh, they, they love pigeonholing, and rightfully so, the NFC East into that game. And then the most fascinating game to me of the three primetime games, by a mile, is this New York Jets hosting the Bills. One, it's on 9-11. So the game was going to be, whether it be the Giants game or whether it be the Jets game, the Jets actually played the Giants. You could have done that game as well, but that game was going to be in New York City on Monday Night Football. That was a lock. My producer, James, hit me up. He's a big Giants fan. He's like, don't you think Giants-Jets, uh, you know, for the anniversary of 9-11? And I said, yeah, definitely possible. For sure, it was going to be one of the two New York teams. Could You could have gone Pats at Jets. I thought that. Because uh, if you remember 9-11, you know, one of the players for the Patriots, Andrewsy, his brother was a fireman, could have easily done that. But I think this is pretty damn good, too. I also think from a football standpoint, beside it's going to be just a big emotional night, right? Uh, 9-11 in New York City, Aaron Rodgers' first game. You're playing one of the best teams in the league. In, in no particular order, you have to put the Chiefs one. I think there's like a big five or six. It's basically the Chiefs. Then Eagles, Niners, Bengals, Bills. I, I would be tempted to throw the Cowboys in there. We'll see how they look, but I they're right there on the cusp. I, that's no order. I'm just saying... That that the Chiefs are one because the Super Bowl champs, and then that five or six, if you want to include the Cowboys, to me is my my group headed into this season. So you're playing one of the best teams in the league, who has been consistently very very good, and who's kind of taking control of your division. And let's face it, you've been really really shitty for a long time. Now you showed signs last year, and now you add Aaron Rodgers. And the big question for me is, I'm bullish on this team. I'm going to pick this team to make the playoffs. But a lot of people, and I, I already saw Coward tweet, you know he's not the biggest Roger guy, is going to be, well, Aaron missed the playoffs last year, trending down. And now there's all this pressure. Of all the teams, we talked about this last week, right, the Broncos are going to have some pressure. But it's kind of unique, right? If Russell stinks, no one's going to blame Sean Payton, and they'll just move on from Russell Wilson. Like, if Deshaun Watson is now just bad, like there's pressure on the Browns because of that contract, they're just kind of SOL. Well, they're screwed. I mean, I don't know what you can do, right? You know, if the Lions stink, everyone kind of anointed them. Like, whatever. Like, if Jordan Love stinks, I think people would be like, listen, you made a move. You had to do it. See if you can find another quarterback. But with Aaron Rodgers, like, the pressure's on. Aaron Rodgers, Robert Sala, Joe Douglas. I mean, jobs are on the line. And you start this game, everyone's going to be watching. Like, I'd argue this game, to me, is much bigger to the landscape of the league and kind of how we'll judge than even Cowboys-Giants, right? Like, I, I view this game as probably the marquee game of week one. And just, like, what's this thing going to look like? And then you look, and this is what Coward was alluding to on his tweet, the Jets play in six primetime games this year. Their schedule starts really, really difficultly. Start with the Bills, who, you know... I don't know how you set the line, but if you tell me the Bills are favored even on the road, I think that's very believable. Then you go to Dallas. Even if New England turns out to not be that great, still got Belichick, a good defense. He hates the Jets. I mean, Belichick despises the Jets. What was one of the stories why Belichick made a trade during the draft on Thursday night? Like, well, he didn't even get good value, but he wanted the Steelers to get a player so he could screw the Jets. Then they go to Kansas City. Then they go, or excuse me, they get Kansas City at home, which the Chiefs are just better than you. And then at Denver, which I don't know if they're going to be good or not, but that's just a tough place to play. And then Philadelphia before the bye week. So you get Philly, the Chiefs, Dallas, and Buffalo. I mean, it is, we're going to find out really, really fast if this Jets team... Listen, I have no reservation when I think about Aaron Rodgers handling expectations. He's been the starting quarter. He, he, you know, replaced Brett Favre, became the best player in the history of a franchise that you could argue in all of sports is one of the most historic and definitely one of the most important to the NFL. He has been the hunted 
as a player and as a leader of a team now for a decade plus. He's used to playing in primetime games left and right. He has played in some of the highest rated games of the last 12, 13 years. So I don't, if Aaron's healthy, I have confidence in him. But what about the other guys? Like they have this young nucleus who, yeah, I like Garrett Wilson a lot, but you know, it's a little different animal playing Northwestern than it is Buffalo. You know, I, I like Brees Hall and some of these players, but they've never had the expectation in the league. Think about their coach. Love Robert Sala, fellow bald guy, root for him. I am, I, I'm going to root for the Jets this year. N- hadn't had much success as a head coach. Not totally his fault. I mean, they picked the wrong quarterback, but, you know, I, I, I would imagine some Jets fans and just football fans are like, is Robert Sala really that good? And I, we're about to find out. Right. And then just the, the pressure of that city, it's going to be very, very interesting to watch how it all handles itself in terms of the play, the young nucleus and the coaching staff. And I, I view Detroit very sim- a lot like the Jets. That's a town that can turn negative fast. Right. Like I, I've been in California the majority of my life. When the team sucks, people just tune out. Your radio, your ratings as a as a radio host, as a podcast, when it comes to the Bay Area or Southern California teams, don't thrive if the team's irrelevant. If it's a basketball team and they win 20 games, or it's a football team and they're winning three or four games, no one cares. People tune you out. But I saw it in Philadelphia. I know New York's very similar. Obviously, Detroit kind of thrive in misery. Now, obviously, they want to win. If you're a Jets fan, if you're a Lions fan, you want to go to the playoffs. But if it goes the other way, People enjoy the negativity that surrounds a disaster in that Northeast corridor, you know? And it'd be very fascinating if things went the wrong way. That that would be the one thing I would say how Rodgers handled that. Uh, something to keep an eye on. If, you know, what if they started? I mean, you could argue one and three is on the table. Buffalo, Dallas, New England, Kansas City. That's that's a very, very difficult start. I I think it's fair to say that Rodgers... And the Jets are, you know, like, what's the story with the Chiefs? Can they repeat? Can they win their third? Right. Buffalo, can they finally get over the hump? Right. I mean, those are interesting. Can can the Bengals maintain this high level play? Like, who's going to be the quarterback for the 49ers? Can Mike McCarthy, like, can he win multiple playoff games and get a contract extension? Like, Aaron Rodgers and the Jets, will this work? You know, is this going to be, is he going to win 11 games? Like, I'm going to pick them to win 10, 11 games. But let's be real, if they were to go like 7-10 and 10 again, some injuries, it looked wrong, their schedule just beats them up, it's easily one of the bigger stories in the league. And it's something we'll just talk about a lot. It's something I'll talk about a lot. I, I mean, I find it fascinating and interesting to begin with, but just the trade, the brand, you know, how's Jordan Love doing? That, that's something to keep an eye on. Like, does Jordan Love have a really good season? Uh, also saw the Giants schedule. You know, speaking of teams that sometimes it's hard. You know, I, the reason why I would have voted Brian Dayball coach of the year, I guess he won it, but why even throughout the season, I'm like, his roster wasn't that good. What he was doing was incredible. I still don't think his roster is that great. It's not like he improved that much year to year. Now, maybe some of the younger guys that they drafted, maybe Kayvon this year is a 10-sack guy, right? Maybe Daniel Jones is that much better. You can have improvement with some guys, but let's not act like their roster looks like some of the top teams in the league. And then when you look at their schedule, they got a ton of road games. We'll find early on, they got a Thursday night game against the 49ers. You know, fascinated to watch that play out. And like I said, speaking of the Niners, like who's their starting quarterback when the season starts? One thing with the schedule, which which is hard, I mean, I could do if I wanted to run a first take show. You know, I, I think we can assume relative health early in the season, but it's so difficult after like October 1st. You know, just from basic things like the guy pulled a hamstring, guy rolled an ankle to bad injuries, to quarterbacks missing play, to teams that you thought were going to be good, aren't good, teams you thought were going to be bad. I mean, I I penciled in last year Seattle and the Giants as the two worst teams in the league. Both of them made the playoffs, right? I mean, I it's just I would have said the Packers locked to win that division. Didn't make it. The Vikings, who I'll give coward credit on that, picked them. Didn't see that one coming. That, that's another one. Like, do they just have another 10-11 win team? I don't know. You know, I think that's what makes this sport so awesome, right? Like I said, there, there's a there's a hierarchy of 
five, six teams, which I think everyone, you know, to, if they remove their bias, just have to acknowledge the final four teams last year are going to be good again. I would put the Bills right there, even though they did get their ass kicked by the Bengals, but they're good. And then the Cowboys. I, I actually, Cowboys earned my respect for how well they played the Niners in that game. They're so physical on defense. It's just I don't totally trust their quarterback in the big spots, but throughout a season, like, they can win 12 games easily. Hell, I mean, they've won. They did that last year with missing their starting quarterback for a minute. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think that's what's cool about the NFL is that there are going to be so many teams that are coming. Are the Jags now just some playoff stalwart? Are they just a team for the next several years locked to win the division? Should be. I mean, they have one of the best young quarterbacks in the division or in the in the in all of the NFL. They have a Super Bowl winning coach. Uh, you know, a guy that just crossed my mind, and you know where I stand on this guy throughout the season is Brandon Staley. You know, a guy coaching for his job. Can can he win a playoff game? Because anything less than going to the playoffs with Justin Herbert, can they compete to win the division? That's one thing. The Chiefs are kind of at the point now where if you told me that, you know, let's say the Chargers won 12 games and they won 11, it's not like the Chiefs can't win the division on the road. I mean, they have a huge advantage at home, but if you told me eventually the Chiefs are a five-seed one year, like as long as they got Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and Andy Reid, I'm still taking them very, very seriously. So exciting times. Uh, this is this is a fun time of year when you see the schedule, but it's it it can be difficult just because things change so fast with injuries. Before we dive into what's next, do you know that Angie's list is now Angie, your home for everything home? And as someone who is currently house shopping and who has bought property before, you walk in, you go. Well, I need to fix the kitchen. I need to want to improve this bathroom. I want to fix some stuff in the backyard. And then you go, well, I don't do this for a living. Where do I even start? Who do I even contact? That's where Angie has 20 years of experience combined with new tools to simplify the process. Over 220,000 pros in their network. They can help you get the best price for your product. They have new projects that are priced upfront and clearly lays out the cost before you buy. With Angie, you can request quotes from multiple pros in your area. The pros in your network are locally based. In just a few taps in the Angie app or click on the site, you can have Angie tackle your home service project from start to finish. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Okay, let's dive into a couple stories around the NFL that don't relate to the schedule. Let's go down to Nashville, Tennessee, and the Tennessee Titans. There was a headline I saw that Malik Willis, who they drafted last year in the third round, his job status is in major jeopardy, as in he might not make the team. And my first reaction to that, of course it is. Like, they just drafted a quarterback in the second round. The general manager, John Robinson, who drafted him, is no longer there. They have a new guy in charge in Rand Carthen with Mike Vrabel. It's like, well, same head coach. Well, that same head coach last year, when Malik Willis couldn't hit water if he was sitting in a boat, benched him for Josh Dobbs, who wasn't even on their team, who was on the Lions practice squad in a game at the end of the season that, I don't know, kind of mattered. Remember, they were playing to get into the playoffs, and he wouldn't play the guy. So I think it's clear that the way that season ended, now you get a new GM. Does he have a support system? Does he have people in the building who support and advocate and want to see him succeed. Because if he doesn't, then he's done. Here's what I know about Will Levis. The GM and the head coach clearly liked him for them to pull the trigger to draft him early in the second round. And by all accounts, they were trying to trade in at the end of uh, Thursday night in the first round, in the late 20s, to draft Will Levis. So Will Levis has supporters in the building. Pretty clear Malik Willis doesn't really. I've been in situations in the NFL, in radio, when my support system left. Do you know what happened? I got fired. You know, I lost my job. It happens all the time in pro sports or just in a lot of industries. When the guy you work for leaves or gets let go and they bring in new people and you are not their guy, the moment things get weird, honestly, some things might be out of control. They just don't want to deal with you. And when I, whenever I see the response of, well, what do you think happens when you bring in a developmental project and you don't give them time to develop? To me, there are different types of development. When Josh Allen was drafted, 
it was clear that year one needed some time to develop. Same with Patrick Mahomes. But both of them, if you watched that, you know, the first year with Josh Allen and the one game with Patrick Mahomes, there, there were just like, okay, you, you could see it. With Malik Willis, I, I think he was easily the worst quarterback in the NFL that played last season. I, I mean, think about Zach Wilson, for example. I'm all for development, but he couldn't complete wheel routes. He couldn't complete a slant route. Like the most, if I'm an NBA player and I can't make a layup, like I, I can't play. Like, wait, you can't make a layup? Like in football, especially at the highest level, when you're playing on Sundays, go routes are hard. You're going to hit those, I don't even know what the percentage is for the good quarterbacks, 50% of the time, right? But there are going to be some routes that should be a very, very high percentage. And Malik Willis had no shot to complete those. It it looked like, does this guy even, should this guy be playing quarterback? And I don't know if he's a good enough athlete to change positions, but from what I witnessed, he's a year away from being a year away. And some quarterbacks change positions for whatever reasons. And to me, Edelman did it. Terrell Pryor did it. I remember watching Terrell Pryor when I had uh, when I did the Raiders post game show, and Terrell Pryor was their quarterback. And ultimately, he just had no chance to. He was athletic enough as a runner, but as a thrower, it wasn't. It, it was a joke. I mean, it was. And he transitioned and he went on to play wide receiver. Now I don't know if Malik Willis is that level of an athlete, but what we witnessed last year, even if he improved, you know. 20%, he's still not remotely close to being an NFL quarterback. And a guy, it's the one position, right? Whoever your backup is, there's a chance, you know, he might not play a snap all season long. And then there's a chance, I don't know, Patrick Mahomes rolls his ankle and the guy has to start a game or come in and play in a tight game. And that clearly happened last year to the Titans. And it was a disaster. And I'm not trying to act like Ryan Tannehill is a savior. I wouldn't want him to be my quarterback either. But... The support system for Malik Willis, I, 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 John Robinson never told me this, but it was p- pretty clear Mike Vrabel's not big on him. The GM has zero ties to him and just drafted a quarterback. He's done. You know, he, He's completely done to me playing quarterback in Tennessee. Now, can he do something else? Can he bring other stuff to the table? Because if he can, then maybe he could survive. But what I witnessed last year, now maybe some team would put him on the practice squad, but I have a very, very hard time. And I mean very hard time seeing him being an active roster quarterback in the NFL, let alone on the Titans. So to me, it's kind of a non-story. I I think the story would be if Malik Willis is able to survive. In in 2023, the amount of money these teams have, you know, no one waits. Like Trey Lance is already battling to be the backup. Zach Wilson is like, thank God everyone in Jets, you know, land is like, he doesn't have to start anymore. These guys were the second and third pick in the draft a couple years ago. We're moving at rapid speed. People aren't worried about signing bonuses and cash. You just you just move on. And, and the way the league works is every year new players are coming through. It's the fastest turnover. It's the fastest cycle of kind of working through guys that can't play. So just, oh, he's a third-round pick. Who cares? Brock Purdy was a seventh-round pick, right? I mean, if you flip those two, it would have been dramatically different. The Niners would have been screwed. Maybe the Titans would have been okay. Uh, Another story. Matt Ariza, who's known as the punt god, was... It came out last week. He was cut last year, uh, allegedly in a a gang rape. He was... was, There was... I, I don't know all the legal terms. There was an accuser that said that he and other guys at San Diego State gang raped her. And it turns out, not only it wasn't true, I don't know if the other guys did, but he was not there. He wasn't present. He had nothing to do with it. And I remember last year when he was cut, everyone was, you know, the media, and we'll get into them here in a second, was freaking out. And I said, the Bills are not cutting him because they know he did it or they know he did not do it. They have no clue. They cut him simply because he's a punter. And it's like, we can't deal with the potential of this being true, even if we believe you at the position you play. I, 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 said it. If he had been the quarterback, if he had been the pass rusher, if he had been the star tackle, it would have been different. They would have let it play out. But when you're a six-round punter, you just don't have the juice. Now, there's a bigger picture thing here. And I've always said this, and this goes back to Deshaun Watson. Listen, I, no one ever has any clue when it's a he said, she said thing beside those two people. 
or in this situation, several people. I don't know, you don't know, and definitely these Big J journos don't know. But last year, the reaction with him was very typical. Like, you know, if I tell you a story, if I just make up a hypothetical story, you have a pretty good idea in 2023 what the media reaction is going to be. And I've seen a lot of like former players that are now in the media, like where's all the people apologizing all those people that wrote articles. They're not going to apologize. That's not what they do. (laughs) You know, if that's your expectation, like we're all going to be waiting a while. Do you remember the last couple of years? Do you remember all the tweets and the articles from everyone in the media about everything that went on in 2020 and 2021? And then as we've learned that actually they were wrong on the majority of it. Have they said a peep? Of course not. They just move on. So if you think you're going to get some article from the Washington Post or the New York Times that says, my bad, next time we should give it a deep breath. Let's see how it plays out. That ain't going to fucking happen. And it never will. So, like, when the situation happened and you get wrongfully accused, you know, it's just you're in major trouble with public opinion and and the people that have, I was going to say pens, but that write these articles for a living because we all know what those articles are going to say. And then if it goes on, you're proven that it wasn't true. You're not going to get articles saying, we fucked up, we, we apologize, you should come back to the NFL, which is a screwed up system. It's why you can't, I don't get caught up in what these people say one way or the other, because they're, they're the most predictable group in this country. You just, you can just give a situation and you know, the angle they're going to take. And with him specifically, like it's tough because it's bullshit. Really? I mean, his career, his life was, I I don't want to say his life's ruined because he's 22, 23 his career was clearly derailed. Now, will someone take a chance on him now that he has been cleared of wrongdoings? I would imagine so, but there still is like, and this is the BS part, is I don't want to say a stigma, but the elephant in the room that follows him, even though he didn't do it. And it gets back to the reaction a year ago. It's just a screwed up cycle. And you go, well, John, you've been hard on Deshaun Watson over the years. Well, yeah, it's like 75 massage therapists. If it was just one or two, I'd say, listen, I, I, I feel uncomfortable commenting on things that no one could know beside these two people. But it was just person after person after person. It's like drip, drip, drip. Like, I mean, let's, let's all use some common sense here. But last year, like the, the reaction by so many people that cover the sport, it was just, it was very predictable. And it's always going to be predictable in these situations. And when it comes out, after the fact that, yeah, actually, it was completely wrong. He didn't do a goddamn thing. It's, it, 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 I can't even imagine being in those shoes uh, of Matt Ariza. Now we'll just see. Like, I would imagine because he is that talented in some of the punts that he had last year in the preseason. Uh, I remember he had like an 82 yard punt that he will get another shot. Uh, I say history shows us that, especially when he has been cleared. Like, this guy's not a criminal. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's such a hot button issue. I I don't know. It's going to be very, very interesting just to see how it plays out. I would say whether it be in the short term, but definitely in the next couple of years, he he will get a shot. Uh, and and last but not least, I I read an article while I was reading Albert Breer's, he kind of does this Q and a, and in the Q and a, someone asked like, will there be tanking this fall? because of these quarterbacks, and specifically Caleb. I mean, Caleb's one of the best prospects going into his junior season of my life. Uh, His size, his playmaking, his production, his arm, the the total package. I mean, he is – I know people that have seen him play live, and they're just like, bro, this is not not a hype machine. And we see hype machines a lot. And listen, I can be guilty of that. Like I was – I pounded the table a little bit last year for Will Levis – you saw it this year with Anthony Richardson. You just see it, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance. Hype machine happens with quarterbacks. This is not a hype machine thing. This is, Jesus Christ, this guy's incredible. Like, this guy is a baller, you know? But, I mean, this guy is just an elite prospect. Period, point blank, end of story. It's very, very difficult to tank in the NFL. You can tank a roster 
and put together the crappiest version of your roster possible. And that's happened. Remember the Miami Dolphins did it years ago. They won three of their last five games. And they beat the Patriots, remember, at the end of the season that ultimately led them to get in the uh, three seed, which then the uh, the Titans beat them in the first round and their the Brady era ended. And I've actually always kind of defended Stephen Ross. Like, we've come this far, keep tanking. And then they beat the Bengals, which I don't know, led to Joe Burrow. It's kind of changed their franchise. The Dolphins lost to the Bengals. <clears throat> or excuse me, the Dolphins beat the Bengals in overtime. So, you know, in basketball, it's so much easier to tank. It really is because you can just put the crappiest roster humanly possible out there in football. You know, you see it every year, even these terrible teams at the end of the season, coaches try hard, random players try hard. The teams you're playing sometimes don't take you seriously. It's just of all the sports to tank, it's definitely the hardest. I mean, we saw it last year, the Texans to to win those, what they win like two of their last four games. They definitely won their last game, and Chicago ended up getting the number one pick. Lovey Smith, like, why did he care? And he clearly didn't. Like, they, they, the coaches, the assistant coaches, they try. Um, so a lot of people are going to want Caleb Williams. And by the middle of the season, you know, when you're one and nine or two and twelve, you're gonna, you know, your fan base is going to have him circled. But it's difficult to attain that. It, it really is, and we see it year after year. We're like, oh, this team is the worst team in the NFL. And they end up drafting four. So, you, know, I mean, the Colts were in absolute shambles last year. They, they couldn't have been any worse for the majority of the season. They drafted fourth. Difficult to get that top pick. You know, it, it really is. No matter how hard you try to suck or even you're trying to win. Uh, so, it, you know, the tanking thing, the NFL is very, very lucky that that's an issue that they just don't have to worry about.